Good afternoon and welcome to today's In Conversation With session. At NatWest, our purpose is to champion enterprise by helping to remove the barriers that too many face. We have an ambition to remove those barriers and support even more businesses to succeed. There are a few ways in which we provide support to small businesses, one of these being our Business Builder, which helps businesses with digital and event-based learning. Business Builder also offers a digital community from which you can grow your network and learn from your peers. Also, our Digital Business Hub provides content relevant for your business in the form of articles, videos and toolkits, which provide intelligent and practical solutions to everyday business challenges. If you have a business need and want to know more about the ways we may be able to support, then please do feel free to get in touch. Thank you for joining us for today's In Conversation With session. As part of these sessions, you'll hear the inspiring journeys of entrepreneurs, learn what motivates them, as well as the hows and whys of building their dreams as they share their learnings with you. Before I introduce today's guest, just a bit of housekeeping, please feel free to use the comment functions to connect with each other by sharing who you are, where you're from and your business. I have lots of questions for today's guests, but I will also ask your questions, so please do post them in the comment section as we go. And now I'm extremely excited to welcome Sir Kenneth Elisa OBE, who is the founder and chairman of Restoration Partners, the boutique technology merchant bank. Ken's technology career spans over 30 years, starting with IBM. And in 1992, Ken founded Interregnum, the technology merchant bank. He was elected as a fellow of the British Computer Society in 2006. He's also currently chairman of Interswitch, Africa's largest e-payments company. He's a former director of Thomson Reuters, a former deputy chair of the Institute of Directors in Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation. Ken is a freeman of the City of London, liveryman and past master of the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists, patron of Thames Reach, for which he received an OBE in 2010, and chairman of charity Shaw Trust. He was an original member of the Postal Services Commission and the Independent Parliamentary Standard Authority, and is the founder and chairman of the Alito Foundation. He's a past Sunday Times not-for-profit non-executive director of the year and was named number one in the 2016 Powerless roster of the UK's most influential black people. In 2015, Her Majesty the Queen appointed Ken as Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant for Greater London and he was knighted in the 2018 New Year's Honours List for Services to Business and Philanthropy. In September 2018, Ken was appointed as the director on the board of Huawei, and Sir Kenneth is president of London Youth, a member network of 450 plus community youth organisations working across London, supporting tens of thousands of young Londoners each year. Um, Ken, at this point, I'm sure if we were with a live audience, there would be a massive, massive round of applause hearing, hearing all of the great work you do. Oh, thank you. That's, I'm blushing here. <laughs> well, um, with 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 a, a I guess a resume like that, it's hard to know where to start. So first of all, I'd like to take you back to the beginning. Um, I know you grew up in Nottingham. Um, as a fellow Midlander, could you share with me about the environment in the UK when you were growing up and in in Nottingham specifically? Well, first of all, you need to be warned. I'm a pedant. So we are both Midlanders, but I point out you're a, you're a West Midlander, which of course, I, I know. <laughs> I was just trying to to, to have the, the synergy there. <laughs> and we, so we of course deeply look down on all you West Midland people, because <laughs> so, that's how life was like in those days. You had to find somebody to look down upon, and that was, that was the <laughs> nearest thing. But as far as we ever travelled as well, um, well it's, it's it's interesting. I think you know, that question is interesting in the context of where we are at the moment in the UK with lockdown and big fears about unemployment. Uh, cash issues, potentially inflation, you know, all these things. That were, and, and most people haven't actually ever experienced anything like what we're experiencing at the moment. Very few people are still alive who were in the Second World War, which is probably the closest, in honesty, the nation has come to something. Except when I go back to my childhood and formative years, we seem to have crisis after crisis. We were bailed out by the International Monetary Fund in the UK, for example. The pound was devalued, whatever that meant. It, we, I mean, we all were confused about what that could possibly mean. We lived under the threat of a nuclear attack, and we were trained at school, taught at school, what to do in the event of a nuclear attack. It wasn't much use to be told what to do, but we were told to get under desks or something. But So there was, there was, a, there was a, a period of fear 
mm -hmm. uh, sort of pervading everywhere in a way that I think the virus hasn't done. The, the virus is scary, but it wasn't that same fear. Somehow the virus is fair. You know, if, mm -hmm. if you catch the virus and you're ill and you die, that's not, it's horrible, but it's fair. That time it all seemed to be so unfair. Events were out of control. People in charge of things didn't seem to really be in charge. Much of the country was nationalised. So if you got really irritated about something, you're probably going to end up complaining to the government because the gas, the electricity, the water, the railways, the air, airline were all owned by the government. So it was a very, very different time. Mm -hmm. uh, than it is today. And we, as I mean, obviously I wasn't a business person then, but we looked enviously at America, which had this seemingly uh, land of plenty, free economy, and so on. So we looked enviously there, and we didn't look enviously anywhere else, uh, and certainly not to the uh, to the West Midlands. And anyway, so life, life, life was complicated, I think. And people in those days, because I was born in 1951, so people in those days, so just think about that for a second. I was born six years after the end of the Second World War. So there were people still wearing their demob coats mm -hmm. because that was the only coat they had all over the place in, in Nottingham when I was growing up. And everywhere was destitution. So the, the last point I'd make is my favourite place to play was a bomb site uh, down, the, down the street, which was a bomb site in those days was where bombs were dropped, houses had therefore been demolished by the council, and nobody had any money to rebuild them. So there wasn't much hope around in the 50s, which is mm -hmm. when I was born. By the 60s, 60s went crazy. We became much more American, music, all that kind of thing. And, and people began to think maybe life could get better. Mm -hmm. By the 70s, when I went to university, we had huge unemployment. We had lots and lots of issues. We had minor strikes, coal strikes, etc. The country didn't function. And mm -hmm. some of that hope in the 60s was again depressed. And then we came out of this in the 70s and into the 80s, and then everybody on the call, I'm sure, can remember life thereafter. So I summarise all of that, Lot it's been it was it was it was a pretty negative environment. Mm -hmm. And yet, despite that, we've ended up where we are today with lots of prosperity, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. So so when I hear people waving the Union Jack and saying, you know what, the national spirit, I think we can do, and so on, I, I have to say that must be true because I've lived through that roller coaster ride, and we've ended up in a far better, unimaginably better place than it was when I was growing up all, all that time ago. The other thing I'd say, though, which is perhaps a bit more of a regret, there was a, a much stronger sense of community. Mm -hmm. So you knew neighbours, people in the street, people did things together. There was, there was a much greater sense of, of, of be, being in together. I guess that's, again, a consequence of the, of the negatives of the war. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that has reduced over my lifetime until COVID. And as the Queen said in her broadcast last year, something which has necessarily kept us apart has strangely brought us all back together again. Mm -hmm. And Captain Tom Moore, bless him, uh, the late Tom Moore now, what he did was amazing, but actually he, he became an, a lightning rod for something which was in the culture because mm -hmm. that, the £32 million pounds that he raised I mean, he gets naught out of 10 for forecasting accuracy, but the £32 million pounds that he, he raised came from people who would never meet him and would never meet the people who were going to benefit from the £32 million pounds and yet felt the need to show that sense of solidarity. And that sense of solidarity, I think, is a, is a British value which is mm -hmm. sustained through that period. Long answer your question, um, but I, I had a great childhood. <laughs> no, no, it's really wonderful to hear and very interesting to hear about, I guess, the differences and the, the the roller coaster that has that has uh, ensued throughout your life, but also being able to draw that spirit that 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 still exists today within the community, and I think it is very interesting that, especially I guess through times of adversity, that you're able to note that as a community we we can pull together when it's as and when it's needed. It's a really positive message to to receive. Um, and so I know you said that um, through, throughout your childhood, uh, particularly in the 50s, there, there was kind of that, that, that lack of hope. Um, at what point, was there ever a point where you envisaged your future or thought about becoming a business owner when you were sort of in your younger years, or is that something that came later? Well, I, uh, one of the things of interviewing me is you get extremely long answers to all questions, except You're that happy one. Happy with that. <laughs> except that one, no. <laughs> Okay. Well, it's fine. I have plenty more questions to go. <laughs> it came much later. <laughs> it's, but there's, there's a serious point there. So I went, as you know, I went to work for IBM after, well, actually after school, my gap year, and then my holiday vacations, and then uh, I went to work for IBM full time on graduating. 
In those days, so we're talking the 70s, people joined an organization like IBM or the bank or whatever for life. And I remember when people left IBM to start their own business, people, others would say, well, you know, the thing about Alan, he was always a bit of a spiv. So the idea of entrepreneurialism in the mm. country was almost not at all. Mm. And there were a few people who were entrepreneurs and they were considered to be spivs. And everybody else joined a proper company and worked in a proper company. So, so no, but the idea of being my own business person in those early formative days, I mean, obviously I played at shops as a child, but actually doing it, doing it properly, no. It was it wasn't the prevailing culture. Okay, no, very interesting to know. And you you mentioned your start with IBM. Um, I know that you you joined them upon graduating from Cambridge. Um, at the time, what was it about technology that sort of interested you or excited you and made you want to go down that route? Well, it's a deeply embarrassing answer to that particular question, but I have to give you the honest answer, and then I'd like to try and turn it into a positive for the, the the audience. So I was in the in the, in the sixth form at school and um, to, about to do my A-levels. And it was sort of, it was a grammar school, we're semi-privileged. So at that point, we're treated half, half man, half boy, as opposed to child all the time. And we had various privileges. And one of those was a, a specially constructed sort of multi-discipline Friday afternoon, mm -hmm. uh, which was how it was presented to us. But it boiled down to you had a choice between two options. Option one was long distance, long country, what it was called country running, cross country running. And the other was going to the local university, Nottingham University, to learn computer programming, whatever that was. So, and I had no idea what that was. So the choice was quite simply between outdoors, cold, wet, miserable, physical energy, collective showers, knackered, going home, or getting on a bus and going to something called Nottingham University and doing whatever computer programming was. Call, call, me, call me a simplistic person. I chose the dry indoor drink coffee when you feel like it, version of those two things. So that's how I got started, writing code at school. I, I enjoyed it. It was quite interesting making machines do my will. It's a very sort of Meccano thing of that, of that era, the Lego theme today. Um, and then when I had my gap year, my two colleagues at school and I, the three boys who were hoping to get into Oxbridge, one was going to be a librarian, one was going to work for a company called IBM, of whom I had never heard, and I, until he told me how much he was going to be paid, had intended to become a bus conductor on the grounds that I'd do something I'd never, ever do again. I'd meet interesting people, anecdotes, etc., etc. But as he was going to earn 25% more than I would as a bus conductor and get overtime as well, and it was indoors and not outdoors, there's a pattern emerging here, I am embarrassed to say I applied to IBM, whatever they were, for a job to discover it was a computer company, and I did the aptitude test and they hired me. And that's really, so I could get zero. I, I mean, I was actually less good at strategy than dear Captain Tom was at forecasting. So at least he got his 10,000, his 1,000 pounds. And I ended up in the IT industry. And then I was uh, persuaded by my boss in the gap year to apply for a scholarship, which is why I applied for the scholarship. I was lucky enough to be awarded one of the, of the two scholarships each year. That meant I worked for IBM in the summer holidays and, the, and, the, and the, essentially the pattern was set. So I can't claim any marks for strategic thinking, forward knowledge or whatever. I'm much better at that now, having learned you can be more efficient in your life if you have a plan than if you just drift along hoping something might happen. But in my defence, I was 17. And I think when we're all 17, we, we don't necessarily know where we want to go or what we want to do. So it's great to hear that there were these opportunities available for you. Hmm. I'm embarrassed to admit, had I been given the same choice, I probably would have chosen the wet outdoors and running. <laughs> <laughs> well, show me some other time. We must explore that. <laughs> so we obviously both think each other's weird. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> um, so um, you obviously you you continued your university career, and so what? And and joined IBM and was uh, were with them for for quite some time. So what was the catalyst for you for founding your first company, Interregnum? So the story is, I worked for I, to IBM for the entrepreneurs on the call. This is quite an interesting uh, point. If I if I could slightly hijack the question, so IBM was started actually it was started a long long time ago. But the man who turned IBM into the behemoth that it was, um, Kenneth Kenneth Watson. Um, and he and he built this business based on a passion for the customer. So it was all about sales and marketing and delighting the customer. One of my colleagues, famous uh, colleague, famously said when asked what IBM stood for by some irritating prospect, he said, "I bring magic." Wow. We, we were we were just we were on a mission 
to transform the world through the use of computing, transform business through computing. It was, so, it was really, it was exhilarating. And our whole reason to exist was to find somebody who had a problem, which was everybody, and then show them how it could be solved using computers, which wasn't everybody, and then sell them one and then make it work. And delighting the customer was what absolutely drove us. And you could win an argument with a really senior person in the company if you were right about using customer as the, as the evidence as opposed to anything else. Now, think about that in most businesses even today. Junior employee can't argue with senior person because there's a rank involved. In IBM, you could. It was the, it was the, most, it was the most exhilarating uh, environment to be in, particularly for a young I mean, a child, really. But IBM became victim to a Department of Justice antitrust suit a monopoly, anti-monopoly suit, as as are now Silicon Valley companies facing at the moment, Google, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the consequence of that is you get broken up. And the idea that someone would come in and tamper with the way IBM was structured, it was like tamping with the church. So I became, IBM became, IBM became very defensive against the DOJ, hugely defensive. And we would read these notices on the notice board uh, in IBM in the UK, the cover and head office, tell us what the latest was, and we'd stand all around the notice board reading them, having no understanding of American law and DOJ and so on. It was an existential threat. What happened inside IBM, though, the power at the top moved from people who'd been in sales and marketing, i.e. customer focus, to the lawyers and the accountants, i.e. process focus, because the defense against the DOJ was about process and doing the right thing at every step of the way, because the minute you got it wrong, whoosh, in they would come. And so the power shifted, and we moved from being this I mean, gun-slinging organization go out to like customers to filling out forms, timesheets, and things. It, it became progressively less interesting. When the DOJ case was thrown out, one of the old guard traveled around the world telling us what had happened. And we were summoned as the IBM UK sales force to a theater somewhere in the West End, thousand of us in this room. And in came a man called Frank J. Comiskey III, I think, he was at my height, so amazingly tall, about five feet seven tall, so not very big at all, and amazingly silver hair, teeth by Steinway, immaculate clothes. And he stepped out to the microphone and, and he said, I'm here on behalf of the corporation to tell you the consequence of the DOJ decision. So we all know we're going to be fired. They're going to close IBM UK down because we're British, so we're negative, assume the worst. And he said, I just want to tell you, it's quite simple. He said two things. One is, the only man in this organization who didn't have a budget last year was the head of the legal counsel, and he exceeded it every year for the last three years. So nobody laughs, because well, that could be quite funny. That's got nothing to do about us being laid off. So we're all still completely silent. And then he said, and the second thing I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is what we've proved by the DOJ case going is that being great is not illegal. And I tell you, we've got this huge surge of sort of messianic pride, and we spilled out onto the street to go and sell more computers to people. But of course, he was the old guard, and the new guards didn't give up, and so the lawyers and accountants continued to run the business. And it just became progressively dull, whereas it had been so exciting. And I think for all entrepreneurs, the day you start to lose that sparkle, that excitement, that, that mission, sense is the day that the graph is going to be going in the wrong way so then it was only a matter of time before i went off to find somewhere else that was exciting and interesting i went to wang laboratories where i was for over a decade and that was the same run by a mad entrepreneur dr dr wang who had invented lots of clever things including some computers and we sold those we were idea was disciplined wang was chaotic but we sold computers we grew it was it was the most exciting piece and again that all went wrong he died and he hadn't put in place succession, he hadn't thought through proper processes, and all the political divisions that existed when he was alive, that he was big enough to keep together, exposed, and the, and the company actually, actually went bust in the end, but the company got into terrible difficulties. I was running the European operation at the point, I didn't like the man that I worked for, and we fell out spectacularly, and I left and started my own business. So, so the starting my own business, came from a moment I didn't have a job mm -hmm. and, and I was offered another big job in another big company. And the little imp that lives inside me popped onto my shoulder as I was about to sign the, the, the contract to go to this big company. And the imp said, so you're going to spend the rest of your life working for great companies that someone else has started. And I remember looking out the window thinking, this is one of those moments. And I put my pen back down again and I rang up the man I thought 
was going to be my boss and I told him I wasn't coming anymore and put up with him being horrible and abusive to him. He said it was a good decision and I started into regular. So, so it, was, it, was a, it was a consequence of the end of an era, really, for me. Mm -hmm. But a big lesson in what happens to when the entrepreneurial flame gets blown out. No, very, very interesting. And I think there are, we have and have met so many entrepreneurs who have started off, I guess, on that that corporate road and gotten to the point where the, the processes or the procedures, the bureaucracy have gotten too much and they, they do want to start something for themselves. And um, so in those early days of starting Interregnum, what were the, I guess, some of the, the, the early learnings that you had to make? Was there anything, any skills that you were able to bring with you or did you have to start fresh and, and build from the ground up? Well, my career in, in uh, so I started out as an engineer in IBM writing systems, but I became a salesman when I realised that the chap who pick, picked me up every morning and took me to work because a salesman to, and was nice to me, had an E-type Jaguar and I had a Renault 16. And I suddenly thought, you know, what, I'm doing all this work, I'm working through the night and uh, you know what, there's a lesson learned here. So I became a salesman, that was much better. And then and then the rest of my career has either been in senior management things or in, actually in marketing or in senior management. So I, I morphed the sales and engineering and so into, into marketing. So so I, I would say if you cut me open, you would see that it says marketing through through the middle of me. It probably says IBM as well, to be honest, but it says it says marketing. And so when I started my uh, my business in uh, whenever it was 1993, I think, uh, for those of, with a good memory, 1993 was quite a difficult time. Various things had gone wrong in the global economy. Um, I didn't care. It was just me and my PA. I just hired a new PA in uh, in London before I gave up my job. I felt so guilty about having just hired this woman and then leaving her behind. I used the pathetic amount of money I got from the leaving them and settlement to get an office uh, in a basement somewhere in, actually, it's not that bad, it was in Knightsbridge, but, but nevertheless, an office, a basement in, uh, in the UK, and I bring Leslie with me, and we started Interregnum. And I sat in this, share, this uh, service office, mine, and she sat outside in her little office, which was kind of the entrance bit in this palatial building, which we were down in the basement. A chap next to me, worked on his own and he had a big much bigger office than mine much nicer really palatial office good bloke and uh, and so we obviously we become friends because we're two people stir crazily trapped in this building so we became chums and i and i decided what i'd observed in the it industry and i by then i'd lived in and worked in america and in belgium as well so i got some genuine international experience what we didn't have in the uk which did exist in spades in america was capital to help businesses, technology businesses get started. And the result of that is that you end up with technology businesses being very being suboptimal and generally led by scientists who've invented something rather than by business people who want to take the thing and do something with it. So they've got the money to hire the business people. So I thought, and I'd seen in America venture capital would solve that problem. So I thought, hmm, okay, you know, that's the solution I can make in the UK. I haven't got any money, so there's no point in doing that. But the other bit we didn't have in the UK was marketing. So again, I'd meet a scientist who'd have an amazing product and he or she, it was always a he actually, would say, well, you know what, what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to knock that Bill Gates off his pedestal with this thing that I've invented. He'd say, oh dear, it's so sad that they're not going to get anywhere because they haven't got any of the rest of the, no plan, uh, no going forward. So I thought, right, I'm going to need money, but the same logic of venture capital applies in marketing. So I, I coined this industry sector definition of venture marketing. So that's what, I, that's what I was going to do. And I wrote my first brochure, a piece of A4, I probably spent two weeks writing it, uh, and then I showed it to the man in the next door office and said, "Would you give me your views?" And he said, um, "Yeah, not now though, because I'm, I'm in the middle of something. Can if you just pop it there, I'll take a look at it. But why don't we have lunch and talk about it?" So I put it there, go back to my office. I have nothing to do now. I've spent two weeks writing this thing. So I remember sitting in the basement, looking up through the window to the pavement. I've got nothing to say to Leslie. I've got nothing to do. Nobody's a ring. I just wait for lunch. So at lunch, I go to the next door and I say, well, shall we go and have lunch? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, but before we go, what did you think about my uh, brochure? And, oh, let's talk about it over lunch. So my heart sinks, my confidence goes down. And, and this is a big thing about starting your own business. Your self-esteem is, is always under threat. So my self-esteem took a major dive. So we go to lunch. By the time you ordered the food and all the rest of it, you know, I can't wait. I said, Sean, what do you think about my brochure? And he said, oh, I he said something like it's really nicely typed. I mean, it was just awful. Not what I, I wanted him to say, oh, yes, you know, this is going to knock the world over. And, and, and he said, Ken, I really got one criticism. I'm now this big. The imp has packed up and gone home. And, and Sean said, you're an IT person, and yet you haven't mentioned IT anywhere in the document. 
I said, well, no, no I, I, I think I'm rather broader than IT. IT happens to be the industry that I've been in, but I've got... Uh, and Sean looked at me and said, Ken, let me tell you something. He said, all the rest of us who don't get IT are terrified by it. And you just get it. You just take it for granted. You know, that is your leverage. So don't worry about the fact you're a generalist. You've got a deep specialism. And, and the IT merchant bank was born at that moment. So I haven't had the, I hadn't had the confidence to mm -hmm. spot that that was actually what I was because it seemed to be so constraining. But actually focus on what you stand for, what you are, what you can do is the key point. So God bless Sean for saying that because actually that made the difference. And the rest of my career, now 30 years or whatever it is, has, has all been in, in IT merchant banking in one form or the other. And if he said, yeah, be a generalist, you know, I'd have been a management consultant or something, and we wouldn't be doing this interview. And I guess as well, it's that comes back to that old jack of all trades, master of none. Sometimes it is okay to be to to know where, where your skills lie and to leverage those. So no, thank you. Really, really great advice shared um, for others out there. I guess then expanding upon that, what what were you able being um, a, spe a specialist and specialising in IT, how did you go about building teams that had those skills that maybe you didn't didn't have so well? So this is, I think, one of the most interesting challenges for, I was going to say for business, small business, but actually it's the most interesting challenge for business. I, how I did it isn't very interesting. I mean, I did it where everybody else does. I hired the wrong people, I hired the right people, tried to learn lessons from the wrong people, tried to cling on to the right people. No, I went through the journey, I'm sure everybody did. But but let me answer your question if I could slightly differently. I, I was on the board of a company called Open Text. Um, in my capacity of, in, of interregnum, that's how we were introduced. <laughs> Open Text was worth about $150 million on market cap on NASDAQ, which is a Canadian company based out of Waterloo. And they were looking for someone with European expertise to help them. So I was interviewed by the, the chairman, who's still the chairman all these years later, and we kind of clicked. I can't say we really clicked, but we didn't not click, as it were. And, we, and he needed somebody in Europe, and I needed a, an extra role. So so we, 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 we came together, and I was on that I was on that board then for a long, long time. Today, so the market cap was 150 million. Today, it's probably 6 billion. So the, the journey that that took is the class, and the same man running it, the journey that that took over that time is that classic entrepreneurial journey. Anyway, one day, we had a, we had a session for customers in Paris. The session was in Paris. The customers came from all over Europe. And the way he'd organized it was he'd managed to buy Jack Welch, who had just retired from GE, as one of the people on the panel, and he got the man who started um, RIM, the Blackberry Telephone Company, because they're in the same town in Waterloo in Canada, to also come along as two guests, and me, because I was the European member of their board as a third person. And we did a sort of masterclass for this audience of customers. It would allow the IT people, the IT buying people. So the three of us, so Jack Welch, <laughs> Jim Borsley, who started RIM, and me, spot the odd one out on this panel talking to the audience, and the audience were asking questions. Chap asked a question, and he said, "I won't do the accent because uh, we, of course, we're trained to look down on the French, which we mustn't do. I won't do the accent." But uh, the French chap said, "I have somebody who works for me, and they deliver their numbers every month and every quarter, without fail. But I know that at the same time he is trying to undermine me all the time. How do I deal with him?" Jack Wells said, "Fire him," and there was a shock. We're in Paris, you, know, you don't fire people, there's a long process, you don't just do like that, it's not like that. So Jack Wilkes said, he's a, a, a square four guy. And people go, why would he say the square four guy? Jack Wilkes realized that I hadn't been very helpful. <laughs> and so he said the following, and it was so profound, I'm happy to share it with everybody, and I share it with everybody with every opportunity. He said, there are two things that matter about people in your team. One is, can they perform? And the other is, do they share your values? He said, and the more valuable of those two is the values point. He said, so if you do a Boston grid, so if you do four quadrants, two dimensions, one dimension is, do they share your values? No, yes. And the other dimension is, are they performing? No, yes. So the first square, it's easy. They are performing and they don't share your values. You lose them because they're obviously a waste of space. The second one is almost as easy. They do share your values and they are performing. You promote them because those are your real assets. The third square, he said, are the people who don't share, so who do share your values, but they're not performing. He said, because they share your values, which is the most important asset of any individual, coach them, because you can teach people how to perform, you can't teach people values. And square four, 
He said, there's somebody who is performing but doesn't share your values. And as I've said to Jack Welch, that is the most valuable thing, values. Therefore, you don't want them on your team. They're spoiling everything. They're poisoning the well. Fire them. And I think that is one of the most profound things I've ever heard in business. And I went back to London after that and fired one of my senior colleagues who had been doing precisely what this bloke in the audience had been speaking about. And the business took off again. So my message to everybody when you're trying to grow your business is make sure you know where you're trying to get to. Have a mission. That's really, really key. If people don't know why they're coming to work every day to get a – well, think about Elon Musk, to populate Mars. I mean, unless you've got that reason to do something, it doesn't have to be that outrageous, but if that's what you're trying to do. If they don't know that. They can't all come together and help contribute to it. But much more importantly, judge everybody on their values. And if they don't share your values, to quote the great Jack Welch, fire them, because the, every person in a post who doesn't share your values is taking out a slot – which is undermining, not progressing things. And what I learned after that was I only now am involved with and hire people whose values I share. That's really great advice. I think especially in this day and age, it is, it's more of a focus now for people who are looking to work for organisations that they share the values with those they, they work for. But equally from an organisational standpoint, it's a really important message that employees understand it's best for them to to also share those values. And I think historically, that's definitely not something that was ever as as important or communicated as well. So it's really interesting to hear that back then this was someone who who, who um, shared that that message. And can, I, can I add one more point to those on the oh. this thing? That little model, so two dimensions, four quadrants, one, two, three, four, as I just said, is really quite a useful way of doing your annual as the as the boss, doing your annual survey of your team. So I had a, I was chairman of a company. We had lots of problems with our sales force. And the trouble with the sales forces that aren't delivering is people just start to pick on one thing and get angry about it as if it's, as opposed to the systemic issue. So I told, I gave a Jack Welch speech and I went to the flip chart and I drew the quadrants. I said to the sales manager, it was just four of us. I said to the sales manager, okay, let's just go through the names of all the people in your department and put them in the quadrants. I said, and when we've done that, you'll know what to do. And it was the most cathartic activity for him because he was able to say, oh, you know, Mary Scoggins, square four. You know, and that was it. And suddenly there was this great sense of liberation because he'd now been able to admit that, that thing had been eating away at him. So it's so that model is quite useful, not just as a, as a theory, but also as a practice. Thank you. Sorry, I, we had a comment come through. I was just checking if it was a question. And um, so my next question is... Um, I guess over the last few years, uh, there's been an increased focus on the importance of diversity and representation, whether that be in the media, with organisations. So when you were sort of starting out in business, was there anyone who inspired you at the time, whether it be from a, a I guess, a diversity perspective or just someone who was inspirational, who was doing something that you aspired to do? So, so I'm, I'm an oddball, I think, really. I, you know, I was the the only person of colour growing up in my district in Nottingham, my mother, my my, husband, my father, technical term, my father had abandoned my mother and me soon after my birth. So I was brought up by a white mother in a, in a white district in Nottingham and I was the only non-white person, which made me a, 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 a topic of interest for people. I mean, obviously I wasn't threatening because I was a boy, but I was just interesting. So there wasn't, there wasn't an issue about communities and all the rest of it, it was just me. And my mother had some other friends of actually Caribbean uh, background, and we would travel out to meet them. Some, and that, you know, they're the only other black people I ever met. So, in, as I was growing up, a small child, so I haven't had the the twenty first century contemporary experience of being a person of colour in in the UK. And therefore, we had to take everything I say with more than a pinch of no, not pinch of salt, but, but but through a filter, just because the circumstances were so different. Of course, I've experienced lots of racial prejudice and so on. But when but when I applied to IBM, I wrote a letter saying I'd like to come work for you because because my friend Nigel had got all this money he was going to get working for IBM. And IBM said, well, let's meet you. And I went in. They gave me an aptitude test. They hired me. There wasn't any, why are we taking a person of colour, even though there, there were in the city some other people like that. So it wasn't a big deal. And, and although it had, I mean, I can give a million stories of, overt and covert prejudice against things that I've done and so on. I can tell you a trillion stories of things that haven't been like that at all. So it's just a thing as opposed to the thing, and it's never been an obsession. So no, I, so I didn't look for ethnic minority, et cetera, diverse role models or anything. I did have lots of heroes in, in business because the people did amazing things. I mean, writing computer programs is not easy, or at least I didn't find it easy. Uh, and 
there were people who knew clever tricks to do amazing things, and you would go and sit at their feet and listen to them talking to you. And there were people who were great salesmen, and they were amazing again. And there was one I worked with who could, he claimed to be able to configure the right computer for a prospect based on the cars in the car park. So, I mean, we, this, so there were people, there were, they, I mean, it's like being in a football club, I imagine. You know, there are starring strikers, amazing goalkeepers, and, and in, in the context, you sit at their feet and learn from them. And I, I am a sponge in that sense. I, I, I am interested in learning mm -hmm. techniques and things from other people. Perhaps a good, it's a, I'm sorry, another long answer, but a good, a good point. I, as a salesman, I'd be a, when I was a salesman, IBM ran some advertisements uh, for computers. And they were useless. They were dreadful. So we salespeople all said, well, they're completely useless, stupid. I don't know, et cetera. And we grumbled and grumbled and grumbled. And we complained to our managers saying, this is ridiculous. You know, this stupid ads, they belittle us and so on like that. So the manager got our uh, head of advertising, UK, to come to talk to this angry mob of salespeople to explain why the ads were really quite good. Well, they were. They were rubbish. We all agreed they were all rubbish. I mean, we're salespeople. We know everything. So this, I remember this chap stood in front of us. He was quite nervous as he presented. And he presented the theory of advertising. I remember sitting there thinking, well, I didn't know it was a theory of advertising. I thought it was just whether you like them or not, you know, as opposed to and he talked about reach and frequency and stuff like that. And then he showed the statistics of how well these ads had been, et cetera, et cetera, and demonstrated, in fact, they were brilliant ads and they did hit the target. And I remember feeling humbled because being a salesman, I, of course, knew everything, but being humbled to realize there's a whole vast subject area that I didn't know didn't understand so so people like that i really admire because i learned things from them and i and i think really in the uk i mean i have to be careful not to universalize this point because i worked in america and what i'm talking about today doesn't apply in america but work but working in the uk especially now it's it is much more about talent it's much more about personality it's much more about values than it is about your ethnic background and and color of your skin etc etc but it's, it's, it's very easy for me to say that, all that's happened, given what's happened to me in my life. But it's also quite important for people to think about that. Because when something goes wrong, has it gone wrong because you're brown or black or whatever? Or has it gone wrong because you screwed it up or because the other person was evil? I mean, there, there are a lot of reasons why things don't work. And to, re, and to, to reduce to the wrong answer is, is bad science. I mean, you need to look at what the real answer is. Now, it might be because of the colour of your skin. And I say, I've had lots of experiences where things have gone wrong for me because of who I am. I became Lord Lieutenant, the Queen's representative. The Queen chose me to be her representative in the biggest uh, county in the UK. And there were some people in my organisation who didn't want me to be their Lord Lieutenant. You know, and, and the, only, the only reason they could possibly have wanted is because of the colour of my skin. So, so no, there are they, these things exist. There's, I'm not denying them. The question is, what do you do about it? And if they're really evil people, then they have to be dealt with as really all really evil people should be. And if they're not, they need they need to be talked to, charmed, understood, you know, debated. It's it's a it's a community. So, mm -hmm. so the answer is, it's been an interesting factor in my life, but it's not been the driving force. And mm -hmm. I continue to admire people who do amazing things all of the time. I met Tim Peake once, you know, our, our great astronaut, and I. You know, I mean, it's, I'm just in awe of somebody who's done that. It's it's really interesting, and I find myself asking unbelievably stupid questions. And when we when we parted, he got into his car, and I said, "Nice meeting you, Tim. Safe journey." And I looked at him looking, and I said, "I've just said safe journey to a driving off in a car, and he's been to the space." And like, <laughs> there are lots of people to admire, lots of people to learn things from. You know, you can you can never be too old to keep learning. But I would I would advise people not to stereotype, not to slide down to the easy answers. And again, I, many negatives can be turned to a positive because you can catch the other side out by by doing so. Thank you. Um, we've had an audience question uh, from Aklak. Um, going back to uh, the previous point about sharing values, uh, they'd like to know how do you know if uh, someone within your team shares your values. Right, that's, that's a fantastic question. And, and there are two, ones, two, two dimensions to the answer. Dimension one is I think we're all driven by our heads and our hearts. Our heads are filled with rules, uh, formulae, instructions, etc., etc., which are actually not compatible. So what we try to do all the time is to work out in our heads what we should or shouldn't be doing with something. And, and the ATAC's question is slightly head-like, i.e., what, what's the formula? The other, the other thing that drives us is our heart. And, and I just draw a very important distinction between heart and gut. Heart is something else. Heart is where your values are stored. And we all know 
what our hearts think about things, but we often suppress it because our head says, well, no, you know, he did a really good job at the last company, you know, he did 102% every year, so, so, and therefore, but your, well, your heart is saying, not for me, not for me. I, the first answer I would say is follow your heart. It's a, every time one doesn't follow one's heart, it's a mistake. I think that's a that's a safe universal point. So despite all the science and uh, you know the bottom up Myers Briggs and all that kind of stuff, actually, you know, is what happens down here. But it's a really important but. The other piece is you've got to make sure your heart's really exposing itself because if your heart says, "Well, I've never met anybody like that before." And therefore, I'm afraid of them, and therefore, I won't hire somebody like that. That's that's not actually your heart. That's a bit of your head still going. Not danger, danger, danger. So, at Short Trust, I have a colleague there who is confined to a wheelchair, has been since she was since birth, and she has 24-hour cover. She can move a hand. She can speak. She obviously think brilliantly. Uh, she's a great leader, but she's in a wheelchair all the time. And, and when she talks to us about what it's like to be in a wheelchair, and, and I think, you know, I've never, ever had a dialogue with somebody in that, in that circumstance. And she's great. And, you know, I've, I've learned so much from this, from this lady uh, about her life, what's hard, what's easy, what we should be doing for people in those kinds of circumstances. But my head originally goes, lady in a wheelchair. Actually, that's not your heart. Your heart says, no, but it's lady, let's talk to her. So, so find that distinction between the two, and we must each find our own method for making it happen. I, we haven't got time, but I've got several methods to make it happen. But my point is, there's a way of doing it, but it's your heart is the first thing. The second thing is their behaviours. And there's a, there's a constant test of people's behaviours. I'm chairman of a company, Remain Nameless, where one of the top team has left and gone to work, not really for a competitor, but certainly not a, not a partner. But has gone. And when the top, when the, his colleagues were told this bloke was going, their first question was, he went for the interview. I.e., he has betrayed us by going for the interview. I.e., it's it's a it's an example of behaviour. And but it was a really good line from the team, which is so he was asked whether he'd be interested in going to work for them, and instead of telling us and us discussing it and deciding, etc. Cetera, etc., cetera, he went for the interview. So it's partly find out what your heart is telling you, and then the second bit is to observe behaviours. But then you correlate them with what your heart tells you, not what your head is saying. And, and that all sounds a bit soft, but it is soft because we're talking about human relationships as opposed to formulae. Thank you. I think that's really important to, as you say, to, to have those, be able to have those really honest discussions with people and, and feel like what, what is it about them that either, I guess, connects you or doesn't connect you and figuring out is it the heart or is it the head? Is it our own prejudice, bias, discrimination, or is it an actual this person doesn't fit because of X, Y, Z? So no, that's a really important thing to, to really sit down and think about as well. We've got a couple more audience questions. Well, a few more, I should say. Um, so one from Taiwo is, what does celebrating your difference mean to you, please, Sir Kenneth? Well, I was on a board uh, meeting where somebody said, I'm really excited, in another company I'm on the board of, we've just hired a really, really diverse woman. And I, and I looked at this chap, and I thought, actually, this is, I'm not the chairman, he was the chairman, so I won't make any comments at all, but I should note that down and use it for the rest of my life. So a really, really diverse woman. It's such a complicated claim, that really. So what does really, really diverse mean? Well, we're all diverse, by definition. We can't all be the same. It doesn't, it just, so, so the challenge is, for people to start to think that just because somebody didn't get a 2-1 from a great university and their dad was something famous, it doesn't mean they're somehow inferior to it. So, so there's, a, there's a logic that we, a cultural logic, it's actually an anthropological logic, it isn't just British culture. I studied briefly anthropology at university and I remember this being one of the things, but it, there's, this, there's this logic that says, that I've got a box and if people fit in the right place in this box, they are something and everything else is less and less, to what is actually inferior. To it, so so I think the right the right answer to the question is: as we are all diverse, there isn't anything left to celebrate, is there? I mean, we're all diverse. So the real question is: why why should I care about that in the context of a business? So if I can steal that question and just flip it over, and, and my answer to that is: uh, well, it's quite simple: reasons of competitive advantage. And unfortunately, lots of people talk about diversity and inclusion, which is also the wrong way around. But that's a pedantic point. But to our diversity and inclusion as a matter of social justice, which of course it is. If you've got a population which has got, I don't know, I do know actually, uh, N million people who live in wheelchairs and none of them have got jobs, that's not fair. So that's a societal point. Uh, and if they've got talent, that's stupid. Ah, 
Now's the bridge into the important bit. Because if I've got people of talent and I'm not using that talent, that's stupid. Why is it stupid? Because it's given me a competitive disadvantage. So my argument to businesses is always, yes, of course, social justice is key. So it would be nice to think you've got a, a quota of women and people of ethnic minorities. So, but that's the wrong way to think about it as a company. You're here to win. It's a competitive game that we're in. So think about it as competitive advantage not about social justice. From a competitive advantage perspective, I would argue if you are not understanding of and empathetic with your customers, your supply chain, your staff, your recruitment pools, if you have a regulator, your regulators, if you're not empathetic with those people, you will be at a competitive disadvantage to companies that are. Therefore, you need diversity of thought, of experience, et cetera, et cetera, in your business. So you can understand why customers are doing that or are doing that, or, or the supply chain will or won't work with you in the way that you want. So for me, it's a no brainer. It's axiomatic that you've got to have that empathy and understanding. And then the second bit is, obviously you can't have a complete universe of people in your board and your senior management team, maybe even in the, in the company. So you've got to find other ways of engaging with them. So how do you engage with customers or supply chain? So you actually understand their issues. But if you hear that somebody does whatever they've got, I, I mean, a good example, again, I, I was once having a discussion uh, with a head, senior HR person in a, in a big organization, and they were telling me about people who worked for them but didn't didn't fit in and left. So that annoyed me because the idea that you don't fit in, what does fit in me? So I, I savaged this person, uh, I had to say, I had to apologize several times subsequently on this context of fit in, and she gave me an example. And she said, we had a Muslim woman who joined us, she was highly qualified, really good at her job, but left after three years because she felt she didn't fit in. I said, why did she think that? She said, well, she was Muslim, and everything that department did of a social nature involved copious amounts of alcohol. She found that offensive. I said, well, okay, you know, I can see that. That was insensitive, but, you know, she should have, she should have escalated that inside her organisation to a boss. A boss, said, said this woman, organised a team-building course for all of the, or session, for all of the department at his country home. The centerpiece of which was a barbecue, and the core of the barbecue was a hog roast. I said, yeah, I'm beginning to see why she felt she didn't fit in. So she left. So that organisation hired somebody at great expense, employed them for three years at a high cost, didn't get much out of them because they didn't really fit in, and then lost them. How much did that cost? That was probably a million pounds of lost cost to that organisation, just because up here they hadn't thought through what inclusivity meant. So that means they, that if you imagine what a Muslim customer would feel like dealing with those people, because there was zero understanding. So they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage to an organization that doesn't do that. So to me, it's a business no brainer that inclusion and therefore diversity is key and, and the rest just flows from it. And I think I would say to the business people on the call, Yes, of course, it's a social justice point, but you know, flip the coin and just worry about this side because you get it right, the, the other side will, will travel with you. Thank you for that amazing answer. We have another question from Jordan, which I'm going to expand upon a little bit. Um, Jordan has asked, why do you think you were chosen to be Lord Lieutenant? And I just wanted to understand, you, you've received um, various awards and recognitions. And so on top of that, what does it mean to you to be recognised for the work that you've done? Well, I, I know why I was chosen to be Lord Lieutenant, because when I was chosen to be Lord Lieutenant, I said to the man who was in the, the clerk of the Privy Council, whose job it is to do these things for Her Majesty, I said, I have two unprofessional questions to ask you. He's a very nice chat. He said, yes. I said, the first one, who did I beat? And I said, the second one, eight and a half million people in London, why me? He said quite appropriately, I'm not answering the first question, which is really annoying. But the second, the second answer, he said, it has it is very much the view around here, from which I assume he meant number 10 and Buckingham Palace, that Lord Lieutenants, the monarch's representative in a county, needs to be more representative of the county that they are that, that, that they are the, the, on, the Queen's representative in than someone who's done great national service and essentially is given that, given that task. So it's more, it's actually my point I was just making about driving empathy with the population. Um, and he, he also added that the Charlie Hebdo, this is some years ago now, the Charlie Hebdo um, uh, mass, well, killings had crystallized people's mind. So the realization 
that the Queen's representative, the eyes and ears in the county, should actually have eyes and ears as broadly across the county, was, was the breakthrough. There's obviously also a symbolism in it. I am the first British-born black Lord Lieutenant in 500 years. So there was, a, I mean, there was clearly an intention to make a statement as well uh, about it. So I think I was chosen, A, because I have got that ability, some ability to connect with the, the population, as it were, in all sorts of ways. And then more importantly, I suspect, really, the symbolism of, of the move. But it is quite an important symbol. I would just take that to the next point, because the Queen has said in this the biggest city, I want my representative to be somebody who is black, born in this country, has done these things, has made these contributions, is now here. The other side to that point, of course, is my combination of business and philanthropy and, uh, and so on is the other reason, because to be a Lord Lieutenant, you have to be somebody who's connected with the charitable sector, connected with the business sector, connected with the, the voluntary sector and so on. And so and I, I ticked, so I got, I got the qualifications as it were, but there's clearly a much, much bigger message there. And, and I think, obviously, I would think this for lots of reasons, but I think as a Brit, I'm enormously proud that my head of state has made that decision. I'm delighted it was me who was chosen, but if she'd chosen somebody else on that same logic, I would have been enormously impressed. I'm just impressed and delighted because I ended up being the, being the person. And it is the most astonishing honour. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so I... Oh, I have a couple more questions, actually, myself. So from everything you've said, it's really clear that you have a passion as well as building your businesses, but also for supporting others, as has obviously been evidenced by your work with the Shaw Trust and with London London Youth. Um, please, could you tell us a bit more about why it's so important to you to support others? So, so I would argue that there's a normal distribution of the population uh, measured against the dimension really of, of motivation. And at one end, you've got people who are evil, and there are sadly evil people, psychopaths in society. And then next to the evil people are people who are bad, and then you've got naughty people, and then you've got okay people, and then you've got good people, and then you've got philanthropists. So there's a spectrum that goes across there and some kind of normal distribution. For society to survive and prosper, the evil people must be contained, and the bad people must be contained as we can, and the naughty people must be encouraged to be not naughty. And the good people should be encouraged, etc. And the way you do that is by the people on this side, essentially love bombing the people on this side. So, so that 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 is my. I have a slightly more sophisticated version of this, but we are running out of time. So that's my that is my uh, my philosophy, if you will. And and if we don't do that, society will crumble. And we see that around the world in nations where the people on this end of the spectrum are in charge. So we see what's happening in Myanmar at the moment. You know, people at this end have taken over, and we see what's happening to people. Uh, and, uh, and in other countries. So so my, my going in Ken philosophy is that, that on this side, we need to love bomb these people and we need to demonstrate to them that this is a better alternative to, the, to, that, to that side. First point. Second point is I, I've clearly, I'm clearly a very lucky person. I used to think that luck was evenly distributed and people were just blockheads for not being able to pick it up. But I mentioned my colleague in Short Trust who was born so incapacitated, she spent her life in a wheelchair. Hardly her fault, hardly her inability to pick up luck. That's got to be bad luck. So I think I have a sacred duty as a very lucky person to share that luck with other people. It's all part about being on this side of my spectrum. But I think it's really important. And those, are, those of us who can help others should help others. I said at the beginning, what's been wonderful, it's hard to say this in the context of it, but what's been wonderful about the pandemic is seeing how people have helped other people for no reason other than they can, because they're good people. And so, I, so they're doing what I'm saying we should all do. And I think, I'm, I don't think, I know that I speak for the majority of this country at any rate, that that's what we do. There are other countries where that's not the case. So there's a, something like the core British values. I'm very proud to be British. I'm very proud of that, of that value set. And I, and I think that's how we make this an ever better place to be, which is the good guys love bomb the bad guys and in so doing stop the bad guys gaining traction. I really like that phrase, love bombing. I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> <laughs> and then thank you so much, Sir Ken. I have one final question. I apologise. I know we're running out of time, so but I just think it's important to share as some all for uh, you to share with us as someone who clearly does so much and is involved in numerous um, activities, whether it be charitable boards, your own um, organisations. How do you manage the demands on your time and what kinds of things do you do to unwind, if you do even unwind at all? 
Right, so, well, well that's another great question, really. Uh, well, I, first, I must, first of all, pay tribute to my uh, executive assistant, Natasha, who manages the diary. Without her, none of this would be possible. I would turn to the wrong places at the wrong time, et cetera, et cetera. And the diary management is a non-trivial task, as she reminds me of the salary review, but it is a non-trivial task, and she does it really, really well. That, that platform is really important. So that's the first thing I'd say. Secondly, I didn't spend much time doing some of the things which I have no patience for. So I might watch television for an hour once a month, for example. So those hours that people seem to spend in the evening, I'm doing more, I consider, to be, I'm not criticizing others, but I consider them to be more interesting uh, things to be done. I, I, I get a big thrill as of doing the things that I do. So I, I, and again, I'm pleased to say I'm now in the privileged position in life. I don't really have to do anything I don't enjoy doing. So I, I get a thrill out of almost all the things that I have to do these days. I have a brilliant family. And so the way I generally unwind is with them. And I've got quite a, I've got half a dozen grandchildren, two daughters, two sons-in-law. They're all really interesting people. It's a very good, tight-knit group of people. We have lots of fun doing things together. It's just so my so my love is, as it were is and I have a wife obviously in this who's wonderful and and that context is in there, but I but I, I again is, there's a luxury you get to my stage in, in in life where I only really do things that I like so the, the distinction between a hobby and and a role as it were is very very blurred the distinction between life and work is there isn't really a distinction for me it's all all really rather the same so I I you know I'm hugely privileged which puts you back on this end of the spectrum, which says, gosh, God, have you been lucky? Start giving back quickly before it, before it, it runs out. So, so the answer is, no, I do unwind. I, I, I hate to think the implication of that question, I appear to be wound up at the moment, but I do unwind. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and I and I you know I read books and listen to music and and so I, and I do all those sorts of things I, that normal people do. I go for long walks. Um, I I should say I've been lucky enough to have I am lucky enough to have two homes, one in London where I am at the moment. But we bought some years ago a cottage in Dorset, in the Piddle Valley, and my cottage is an 18th century cottage on the banks of the River Piddle, which flows through my garden and is surrounded by woods and farmland and so on. And when I'm there, I am completely chilled. And when I'm here, I'm slightly more wound up to stick with the alter. So, so no, I've, I've, I think I've got my life pretty well organised to uh, be doing good and enjoying myself. And I, perhaps I'll wrap up by saying one of the great privileges of the world that I found myself in is I now have a coat of arms. And so my wife and I went to the College of Arms and we spent a happy uh, several sessions with the Windsor Herald designing my own coat of arms. So I've now got my coat of arms in one of those books in a vault in, in the College of Heralds along with all the ones going back to William the Conqueror. It's so exciting. It's another wonderful tick. But the motto on a coat of arms summarises everything you stand for, your values, etc., etc., etc. And Julia, my wife and I, spent quite a lot of time, about 10 minutes, thinking this through because it was blindingly obvious what it should be. And my motto is do well, do good. And that characterizes what I try to do, where my values are, how I occupy myself. And so when I'm not doing well, i.e. making money, building businesses, I'm trying to put it back into society to do better. And funnily enough, I find they just keep amplifying. And the more I do for other people, the more they do for me. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's a fantastic motto. This has been a fantastic session. I just want to clarify that you don't appear wound up at all. <laughs> it's just because you do so much. I just wondered where where, where the time was. But um, no, honestly, I'm sure, again, our audience are joining me and giving you a very virtual, huge round of applause. So thank you to you. And also thank you to Natasha for making this possible. <laughs> and thank you also to the audience for joining us today. And we're back in a month on the 10th of March, where I'll be joined by Sharina Shiv, who is the founder of Devotion Property Management, Aston Women in Business, and most recently, the Startup Startup Now podcast. So I look forward to seeing you then. And until then, stay safe and stay blessed.